Hey, good morning. Welcome to another episode of New Year Black Me. You may have already heard about this, but I wanted to talk about it. And as you've listened to a lot of my um, episodes, I've been talking about reparations. And the reason why um, I'm mentioning this is because so many people think reparations is just about um, cash payment. And it, it, it does involve cash payment, but you got to remember, it's also about um, changing um, a lot of the things that were as a result of what happened um, back during Jim Crow, some of the things that was derived from slavery, black code laws, combat leasing. So you have to understand that reparations is not just slavery. It's righting all the wrongs that were done. And um, we talked about in the last episode about a lot of the things that were happening about um, that happened post slavery during the reconstruction period going all the way to Jim Crow. So one of the things I did not go into full detail is riots, a lot of race riots. You've heard of the Red Summer, um, Tulsa, Oklahoma. There is um, Arkansas, uh, Elaine, Arkansas. There's Atlanta riots. There's Chicago, Detroit. There's Rosewood in Florida. So, so many things that were, were going on um, that was a result of um, of us being free because a lot of these things happened in the early 1900s. Well, blacks had to have um, things of their own and they said, we're not gonna let that get us down. So Black Wall Street had uh, what you, uh, you know, hospitals, um, schools, homes, nice homes. So they had just pretty much their entire unincorporated um, town. So they've had their own um, businesses and everything. And they were actually doing quite well. They had, um, I believe they even had an airport. So because they were doing well, um, a lot of the whites on that time were like, you know, who do they think they, they are? What are they um, doing? So they were very upset and it all started um, with a um, elevator operator. A white lady was getting on the elevator. It's not clear of actually what happened. It's believed that he may have actually stepped on her toe, um, you know, her foot, and she screamed. And when she screamed, they claimed that he had assaulted her um, in, you know, sexually. And of course, as you know, whenever someone um, whenever a white woman is assaulted by a black man then white mobs come and then they try to um be a vigilante so to speak so what they did is they went to that town and they started um harassing the people bombing the town and just so much more i'm gonna let you watch a video just in case you don't understand about the Tulsa, oklahoma um situation i'm gonna just do a quick video so you can understand what this whole massacre was because that's what it was and from that point we still have um survivors so there's three survivors and they reached out to the supreme court asking for reparations for what was done in this case they should ask for monetary damages because they've lost their home and so much more so i'm going to show you i'm not going to give you the clip on what um congress uh, the, the the women speaking to congress they're about because the, the Tosa, Oklahoma was in 1921. So these women are just over 100 years old. And they are still having to seek for reparations. And we have a president who has signed off on giving $50 million in an anti-hate um, Asian bill. And that's fine and dandy. But what happened to our bill? What happened to giving reparations to the people who were affected? And... Um, and like, like, and I'll mention this, even though we're not going to talk about Rosewood. With Rosewood, they gave like scholarships and things. That's not good enough. See, at some point, cash payments needs to be the answer and the only answer. Um, and our, and in this case, I think, um, as for us, ADOS, um, American descendants of slaves, we need, we need cash payments. And you need to right your wrongs. So all the laws that are on the book, the qualified immunity um, with police is so much more. We need all of these things to be fixed. Okay. No more just talking about criminal reform because 
only 1% are in the criminal justice system, going through the criminal justice system. Not one, I say 1%, 1% of us. So um, what about the working blacks? Um, so, and the blacks who are doing well, we still need policies and changes. We need healthcare ref reform as far as um, black women, black people um, in general, but a lot of black women are facing a lot of issues in the healthcare system, including myself. Um, a lot of people are having a hard time getting homes. But, so going back to Tulsa, Oklahoma, they have taken and destroyed um, towns. I mean, just hundreds and hundreds of homes and people's lives have been destroyed because of this massacre. Take a look at this and tell me what you think in regards to this reparations. And do you think that um, since a lot of the descendants are gone, should they not get reparations? Should they um, provide um, cash pay? I think they should do more than um, more than one thing. I, I think they should do cash payments and all the homes that were destroyed, they should put that back in giving homes to um, blacks in that area um, because you destroyed homes, towns, and businesses. So you need to give money back in the form of reparations. In addition to cash payments, you need to give that money, um, give all those reparations of the equitable rep reparations, homes and things that were lost back to the black community in that area. But take a look into um, this documentary and leave your comments as to what you think about what the government should do reparations that they was given notice out on the street leave town leave town they're killing all of the black people an entire community was destroyed their wealth was taken from them it looked as if it was hiroshima atomic bomb had gone off what few trees were left had no leaves. They were just charred. And then the story was suppressed until almost now. The Greenwood District, or what it becomes known as Black Wall Street. These are people who own their own homes. They had their own businesses. It was a vibrant community. What happened? In 1921, on May 31st through June the 1st, was 18 hours of sheer terror. So I never want to see anything like that again. Never. We don't know who fires the first shot, but that begins a bloodbath. African Americans are attacked in their homes. They are machine gunned down in the streets. They woke up to the sound of bullets hitting their home. Smoke and flames are everywhere. They set fire to the curtains so the houses will burn. Airplanes, the morning of June 1st, flying over the city and dropping turpentine bombs. You are seeing them get away with murder. Murder. It wasn't the only event that took place during a period known as the Red Summer of 1919. Ultimately, it was all covered up. There are generations of folks who grew up in Tulsa who never heard about this. There's the immediate aftermath of the race massacre, and there is rebuilding in that period of time. The same will, ingenuity, and determination of black people to make a way out of no way. The charred remains of their hopes, the embers of their dreams. And yet from that wreckage, they rebuilt. And we believe very strongly that black Tulsans deserve truth, reparations, and repair. But there was tremendous resentment, white resentment, to the economic success of Greenwood. Whites understood that economic prosperity would ultimately lead to questions of racial equality, social equality. Racial equality, social equality was a non-starter. Segregation was the rule of the land. What was life like in Greenwood then? I asked two survivors of the 1921 massacre. Viola Fletcher is 107. Well, we had friends and <clears throat> played outside and visit with neighbors and was happy there with our parents. Just loved being there. 
and 106-year-old Lessie <laughs> Benningfield Randall. What was it like before the men came in with guns? What Were there stores? Was there movies? It was getting to be a pretty nice place. They had theater, and they had other places of recreation, and they had churches. And they came in and tore it all down. There were approximately 200 businesses in Greenwood, circa 1921. And not one of those businesses are left standing. <laughs> The 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre occurs, triggered, catalyzed by an event between two teenagers, a black teenage boy, Dick Rowan, 19 years old, who shine shoes downtown, a white girl, Sarah Page, 17 years old, who operated an elevator in a downtown building called the Drexel Building. We don't know exactly what actually happens, but upon entering, we think he may have tripped and bumped into the white elevator operator, Sarah Page. She screams. The clerk from a nearby store comes to her rescue, and Dick Rowland did what any normal African American would have done. He ran, and he ran to Greenwood. Before the day was over, he was arrested and brought to the county jail, which, of course, is on the south side of the tracks in the midst of the white business district. The Tulsa Tribune published an article entitled, Nab Negro for Attacking Girl in an Elevator. The newspaper, the white newspapers, implies that there needs to be a lynching tonight. And so black World War I veterans come down to the courthouse to protect this young man from being lynched. One of the white men in the crowd attempts to disarm one of the, we believe, black veterans. A shot is fired, it hits a white bystander, and they begin firing upon the black men. In the words of a number of survivors of the massacre, all hell broke loose after that. The violence lasted roughly 16 hours. A black man in the Greenwood community put up a vigorous, albeit short-lived, defense. They were outnumbered, outgunned. The sheriff has deputized a number of white citizens who have no training in law enforcement, mob control. They have now been given legal permission to participate in mayhem. Looting and murdering. People are shooting guns and killing people and all. If we don't leave, they'll do us that way.